Praise God, it's good to have all of you on and uh, just being hungry and, you know, in the face of world issues or in the face of like personal failures or whatever that we can we can look to him. I was saying to someone the other day, maybe it was the the blog, I said, you know, when I get in trouble, I don't run away from God. I feel like it sometimes. I run to him because I know he's the only one that can really help. What I want to do is uh, <clears throat> read, and we're in Genesis chapter 18. And I'd like to read again, uh, let's see, verses uh, 1 through 8. And um, so why don't I just do that? All right, here we go. And the Lord appeared unto him, talking about Abraham, in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the door, in the tent door, in the heat of the day. I've been doing that lately. And he lift up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread, and comfort ye your hearts. That's the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit's heart. After that ye shall pass on, for therefore are you come to your servant. And they said, so do as thou hast said. And Abraham hastened into the tent unto Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it and make cakes upon the hearth. And Abraham ran into the herd and fetched a calf tender and good and gave it unto a young man and he hasted, hasted to dress it. And he took butter and milk and the, the calf which he had dressed and he set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. Um, some of you knew we were going to be, uh, you know, getting into these scriptures. And uh, several people had shared some things with me uh, of what the Lord had shown them, totally apart from me, in parts that I haven't even shared yet. Um, but probably went back and rehearsed a little bit just because, uh, you know, knowing that we're going to get into this area. And uh, so I had the opportunity to um, uh, hear from Mallory and to hear from my wife, Debbie, who both of those had, uh, um, Mallory's was way prior, actually, to us getting in here. And... Uh, and then Deb, just in her, she said, uh, she said, I, I cheated. I read chapter 18 before we started it. <laughs> I said, you can, you can read all you want, anywhere you want. Just really simple. That Abraham's question to, um, to them uh, was, if I found favor, and he was talking to the them, the God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, and it was just based on that the favor of the Son. If He is in that Son and He is recognizing that that's where their part is, and if that was really who they were, then He wanted to just pour right back out over them. So that's why He hastened to go dress the calf and and to take care of them and not just receive from them because He recognized from the heart and the core of who they were, and that if he's in that same relationship, he wanted to pour right back in with that same heart and spirit. Amen. That's that's good because that's, uh, <clears throat> I just shared that on a blog uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact, and that, that God is love, 
and then God came into us, and there can be a flow of that spirit back and forth. Um, amen, amen. <clears throat> and the emphasis on his heart once again. So Mallory, uh, if you have some things to share, we'd love to hear it, please. Are you there? Okay, yeah, yeah. here I am. I'm gonna um, just read from my notes, and it's about, this is about three paragraphs. Is that okay? Yeah. About three paragraphs? Okay. If it goes, if it's too much, just cut me off. <laughs> um, I, this is on spirit and approach, so that's kind of the angle here. When, um, let's see, the Lord comes to Abraham, and when Abraham perceived the Lord, he ran to meet them and bowed himself. Abraham's speech is meek. He gets low first, and then he relates to the Lord by ministering to him. He washes his feet. He offers them bread. And then in verse 5, he says something profound, something that he that shows that he gets it. For therefore are you come to your servant. Then Abraham kills the calf and offers the Lord the sacrifice to eat. All of this is done in haste. He runs to meet the Lord, hurries Sarah to bake the bread, runs to get a calf slaughtered and prepared. The hurried nature of Abraham's service to the Lord shows a lowliness of mind concerning himself. He is not approaching the Lord in a dignified manner. His manner, rather, is one of a servant whose bowed heart is such that it moves his entire being, spirit, soul, and body, to do everything in his power to accommodate and honor the Lord. This is memorial ministry. He has poured himself out upon the Lord, offering rest, washing his feet, and killing the sacrifice, and not asking for the seed. Abraham's spirit and approach was received by the Lord. As a result, the Lord's response was in verse 10, I will certainly return during the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. It seems as though Abraham bringing forth the seed was contingent on a certain heart condition. When the Lord saw that Abraham's heart was in a good place, it was low and it was ministering to the Lord instead of himself, it was time for the seed to come forth. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> Amen. Well, we left off at verse 2, and so we'll be at verse 3. And just reiterating both of the things that uh, Debbie and Mallory shared but I think verse 3 sets that in a nice framework. This is when the when Abraham saw them and we we mentioned that last week and ran to them. And and, uh, and here in verse 3 and said and he said, "My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant." And just a couple of things here to notice. Um I think as Mallory was saying, uh, immediately he sets things on a proper basis between him and God. And when I say a proper basis, I know that uh, there are churches that talk about, well, we need to be humble before God and, and this sort of thing. But we're really talking about more than just being humble before God. We're talking about a deep-seated recognition of, of um, that He is our source and that we are the vessel of that treasure and that um, it's not dependent upon us um, and that we're one with Him but one in terms of being the channel through which He can work. And so uh, the first thing He, he says is, you know, my Lord. He calls him Lord. I'm sure it's in my notes here somewhere, but I think it's interesting that he sees the Trinity and he calls him my Lord. And I want to address that later on. I don't know if it'll be tonight, but he calls him my Lord. And the word Lord there is Elohim. And it is very significant throughout this this portion of chapter 18 because um, what what we're seeing here is a complete reversal that's going on with uh, with Abraham uh, we left chapter 17 the last part of chapter 17 um, 
he's talking about what he wants. You know, he says, you know, Lord, but he's saying, uh, oh, that what I want will live before you. Oh, that Ishmael will live before you. He's got, he's got his own mind. He's got his own ideas. He's got all of this. And folks, um, it's not just being humble with our own mind and ideas and things. It is being in a state where they're not ours, they're his to choose. Um, and, and, and many times they're not ours, uh, they're not his because he's not going to do that. He's, for example, Ishmael. He's not going to give way to the, to the firstborn, his firstborn son in representation by Isaac, by letting Ishmael become that. He's not going to do that. And, you know, I, I do. I, I admit it. I talk about God's heart a lot. But I imagine, imagine his one man in the earth, Abraham, God appearing and starting to say, hey, next year at this time, you know, Sarah's going to have the seed that we've been waiting on for so long. And, and Abraham responds with, Oh, that, you know, oh, that Isaac, I mean, uh, Ishmael may live before you, may live before you. Um, I mean, that would be like God there and Jesus standing in front of him and Ishmael standing on this side. And we walk up like Abraham and we shove Jesus out of the way and we shove Ishmael in front of God and say, here, Come on, please accept this. You know, I'm, you've been real good to me and, you know, I'm your man in the earth and accept this thing. You know, uh, I, I just think that sometimes in the scriptures and not just in the scriptures, but we can see it in the scriptures. In the scriptures, we don't notice um, the wounded heart of God at times. We don't notice it. We don't see it. We don't. We just see a story. We just read on with it. And so, so this was the. This was how we left chapter 17, and we we come into chapter 18, and oh my Lord, it's a new day. There's an amazing thing going on in the heart of Abraham, and he is completely focused on what the Lord needs, what the Lord wants. Um, and uh, he has he taken a position whereby when God sees that, then God will allow him to minister. It's, it's the difference between the Zadok priesthood and the Eli priesthood, if any of you remember that study. Uh, uh, in chapter 17, if Abraham was a priesthood, it was more like Eli and the Eli priesthood. In chapter 18, we got Zadok. We got the one that in Ezekiel 44 and roundabout in there, um, God says, you know, this other priesthood is not going to minister to me. They will not come into the Holy of Holies. They will not minister to me, but the Zadok priesthood will. It's, a, it's, a, it's not a special choosing. It's a heart condition that qualifies you as that. And um, so anyway, um, so he starts, he starts off with that. And, and he, he looks at the three and he says, my Lord. He says, Lord, to three as if they're one. He says, Elohim. And it makes perfect sense in this context. Whereas our word Lord doesn't capture the meaning of Elohim the way that Elohim was and the way that Abraham began to know him. So um, he calls him Lord, and then, but then he immediately also qualifies the rest of it. And he says, he calls himself thy servant i am you're the lord and i'm here to serve your needs and um you know that's um it's his heart 
that's it's his heart that we seek to serve. I know uh, a, a lot of times we th we're like if you're a shepherd, uh, if you're a pastor, uh, you'll hear him say, well, my first concern is the sheep, if you get that at all, the, uh, the building program, the whatever. But some of them, my first concern is the sheep. But David didn't do that. David said, my first concern is my father's sheep, my father's heart, my, what my father wants me to do. Uh, and, you know, a true shepherd, when they fail that on any level, it hurts. It's, it's, um, it's almost devastating in the sense that it's not a failure of, well, I didn't do the job right with the sheep. It's a failure in relationship to the one whose sheep they are, that you, you see them as his and you are doing what you're doing not to please the sheep. You're doing it to please the Father and to be with him. And so um, he, he, he comes back with that. But then there's that other little, that other little word that's put right in front of both of those. He says, my Lord, thy servant. Oh, I mean, it's precious. It's precious. It's so much a huge leap from chapter 17. And he is, um, he is, he's saying, you're, you're, my, you're not just Lord. You're not just understood theologically to be Lord of the world, Lord of the universe. Uh, so Lord, you know, da 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 da. He comes and and says the first word out of his mouth is my, and the second one is Lord. <laughs> And then he uses that famous saying, if I have found favor in thy sight, which is, excuse me, which is used in the book of Esther and so many other places. If I found favor in the way that you see this, you know, in your sight. Um, then he says, you know, I pray the, you know, pass not away from thy servant. I'm not just a servant. That's what he's saying. I'm your servant. I'm here for you. Don't you get that feeling from what the, the scriptures we read of all that, that takes place here? That he's, I am here for you. By saying thy servant, he, I mean, what if we quit using terminology that has no meaning like, well, I'm your servant, Lord. Oh, oh Lord, your servants gathered before you. And uh, we, we said something like, oh, Lord, we are here for you, which means thy servants. You know, we're here for you. We're not here for us. We're not the Lord's. We're not thinking about ourselves. We're here for you at my worst, which I can, you know, I can feel down just like anybody else at the slightest thing that can, that I feel is not reaching his heart because, you know, um, so that's, that's our heart. That's our heart. Our heart is his heart and that's that's what we're getting in this picture right here and um, and then uh, I wrote down another interesting thing was that he called the three by a singular form not plural it's as if he saw one being its father its son its Holy Spirit but he sees one and it comes up to him as one. Okay. Okay. That cuts across a lot of Christianity right there because we're, we're always, we're either just got kind of generically saying God, which is not 
which is uh, uh, not in our minds Elohim. As I said, we'll address that sometime here. But we're just saying God, just a generic term, you know, God. Um, whoever's up there, <laughs> you know. Um, or we say Father, or we say, you know, Father God, or we say Jesus, or we say Holy Spirit. Um, but there is a richness in this name Elohim that Christianity doesn't seem to have, that uh, is an awareness of Him on a deeper level than just, you're God, you're the supreme being, you're the one in charge. It's so much richer uh, of, of the flavor of what it presents to us of, of Him. And so, um, uh, so why did he, why did he address him this way? Why did he number one? Why did he see him as one? Why did he say, "My Lord"? Why did he say, "My Elohim"? Why did he say that? Well, you know, first of all, I mean, it's obvious that uh, he was, you know, very familiar with God. I mean, he spent his life from the time he entered the land, and really it was before that, but from the time he entered the land all the way to now, when he's a hundred years old, hundred years old. God bless him. I don't want to be a hundred, but that's me. <laughs> anyway, um, he spent it with this person. He had a personal, per, no, he had a person relationship with God. Not a personal relationship, because what that means in Christianity has a lot to do with rituals and, and uh, what we do, how much we give and all this kind of stuff. He had a person relationship, and he walked with that person, and he spoke with that person on a regular basis, and it all wasn't, as, as we're going to see something amazing within these verses, it all wasn't about himself. Um, it, he, he had gained traction with, the, with Elohim. He gained a, a present awareness that he is, he is here, he is here, he is uh, speakable, meaning you can, you can talk to him, um, you can uh, cry with him, you can, you know, just uh, enjoy the things of his heart, the realities that are eternal, and know that you're enjoying that with someone, you know. Uh, I, I'm sure that we probably try to seek out someone that, you know, would really understand and appreciate something that we saw, and we'd like to share it with them, and them, them really respond like, oh, praise God. Well, <laughs> we don't get that from him, because he never says, oh, praise God, because he is God. He just goes, you know, he, you could just feel the joy that you have crossed over Jordan and you left that behind and now he's your constant companion. And I, and I know that that can be taken in so many different ways, but Abraham took it in one way. And it all trickled down finally to my Lord, your servant, and not some sort of a, you know, punishment level or something like that, but a, a true fellowship with God. So, I mean, that's why he recognized the three and who they were, you know, I mean, I don't know. I, I just think if 
if I was out, just out and about, or sitting on the front porch of my house, and three guys come walking by, and it really was the Trinity, would I go, there they are, you know? Would I know them? Because, see, Abraham had to know them beyond their clothes and their beards and their, their whatever, their externals. He had to know them on the, on the inward parts. He had to examine the, the inward parts. Surely, surely he had to. Surely, surely he has done that in the past. And the, he's familiar with that one. He's familiar with that one. And um, uh, that, you know, uh, I wrote down even the things he suggested for, to give to them uh, in the next several verses spoke of a close, caring relationship he had for Elohim. A close relationship, you know. We, yes, again, we can say, I have a personal relationship, but do we have a close relationship? And if we do say, I do have a close relationship, are we referring to, um, yeah, we're close. I mean, he hears everything. I, I, he gives me everything I want, and, you know, he protects me, and he does all these great things. A close relationship with somebody, folks, is that you know their heart you know their hurts. You know their joys. You know, and this now we're talking about Abraham with Elohim, and you care deeply about that more than you do. I mean, I'm, I, you know, I am convinced. This is just me, you know. That's that Randy's <clears throat> weird thing that he's always talking about the heart of God. <clears throat> but I am convinced. That Abraham, after that encounter in chapter 17, and the re one reason why he's so different in 18, immediately, just vastly different, is that he, after, you know, because sometimes we, I'm, I'm sure you're with me on this, sometimes we mess up or we do something or we say something or we do, whatever. <clears throat> and later on we realize, oh my God, how far that off that was, you know. Um, uh, you know, I, I remember when I was in Bible school and, and Brother Lumen would preach and share or something, and um, I just wanted to be near the, that Jesus because I could tell that it was different than a lot of other people. And I was in my early 20s, and I would go up. I couldn't resist. He's putting away his stuff. Everybody's piling out. And I would go up and stand by the pulpit where he shared. And invariably, I would say something so stupid in, tr in, in my attempt to try to say something spiritual that could spark something. <laughs> and I'm telling you, it happened a lot. You know, not just with him, but several other the teachers. It's like... Oh, brother, and I'd walk off and go, man, you know, I just need to keep my mouth shut, you know. I don't, I don't know him like he knows him. <clears throat> I'm, I'm barely a Christian, <laughs> whatever that meant. Um, well, you know, we all do stuff like that, and I think that Abraham, I think that it struck him deeply into his core and he thought what was I doing what was I saying why did I say you know except you know let let Ishmael walk before you in place of your firstborn was I out of my mind God can't we you know reverse this and mark it where it never happened or whatever well, no, but what we can do, like what happened with Abraham here, is we just get in that right spirit. We just get with him. and You, you only get that by seeing him. You're, on, you're only going to get that image by, by looking into his face and being changed from glory to glory. And so, um, so there's, there's a, a constant relationship also of going to look into that face and, and melt and, and hear 
hear the, you know, we talk about the, the scriptures are the word of God. Mm, I wonder, I mean, I really do. I wonder how many people read it and they really hear the heart of the Lord in the words as he's speaking and presenting and, and everything. Um, uh, or do we just hear scripture? You know, what a difference. What a difference that is. So anyway, um, um, so one of the reasons why uh, I think he recognized them, uh, one reason why he recognized the three in one, or one reason why he recognized Elohim, is that, um, this is going to sound weird, but tradition passed down by word of mouth from those who knew him, those who knew the three. And, you know, I don't know if you've ever done this. I did do it. I just took a chart and I, I, I put a line and this is where Adam was, was uh, born. And then I drew a line. I, I, I divided the, th the, the chart in sections and I drew a chart uh, leading to how many years he lived. So it was all the way down to here he lived. And then I started going through, you know, all the different ones. Of course, Methuselah went ooh, way down here. And I was shocked of how in many of the circumstances, Adam was still alive or in earlier parts here when the stories are going on and stuff like that. And, you know, because they lived for a long time back then. And so it wasn't just word of mouth for like what we would get word of mouth 2,000 years ago or whatever of, of Jesus and 6,000 or whatever for, you know, the creation, uh, however that's marked. But <clears throat> we would, uh, they would get it and it would be fresh. And, and he would have heard it said that Elohim said, let us make man in our own image after our likeness. He would have heard that. And, you know, I mean, one reason why um, God chose Abraham was because there was, I don't know how to put it, he was listening. He had a, he had a heart that wanted to know him and to hear him. And um, so, um, so I want to read a little bit on this Elohim part here. Um, here in verse 3, when Abraham calls him my Lord, he uses the Hebrew word Elohim. Many times we address God as individuals, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And some of this I've already said, which is the general designation used for the Trinity. One reason we do this is because the generic Christian designation of God is not very intimate. The, to use the, the generic word God for many Christians is not a very intimate thing. It's usually only in relationship to addressing deity. You know, oh God, you know. Or, um, as I said, the supreme being, which, which are high and mighty things. Uh, but Elohim encapsulates a conversation with all three in terms of their being. In other words, it is, it is the three in one, and it is them in the oneness of their desires, or single in their desire. They are single-minded. They're single-hearted in their desire. Um, Elohim encapsulates a conversation with all three in terms of their being and is not taking into consideration them individually or their individual participation. So this is, this is finding, it's understanding them, it's finding them 
but it is realizing that in, in heart, in desire, they are a single unit. They are a single unit. Um, and I wrote, uh, it's not taking into consideration them individually or their individual participation in creation, redemption, or any other area. In other words, to call upon Elohim is to approach Him in acknowledgement of His being and oneness together, not just oneness as we, because oneness as we use it, usually is primarily about us. You know, we think of oneness and I'm one with Him, but you know, but it, it, this is talking about really not even seeing it in relationship to us, but in relationship to them. Um, in other words, to call upon Elohim is to approach Him in acknowledgement of His being and oneness together as opposed to an approach to merely obtain something for ourselves. Abraham knew that the one, the one person, approaching was God in this manner and called him Elohim. And before I read the next paragraph, you know, I am in no way suggesting that um, as a church or as a group of believers that we start using the word Elohim. Uh, the Hebrew word, oh, it's the Hebrew word. I, I have no, that's, you know, I'm not going there at all. It's just that I'm seeing something that really drew me in and other things. <clears throat> From the passage used above at creation, it was also revealed that Elohim, Though three, all had the one passion and desire. So how many times in, uh, what is it, verse 26 there in Genesis chapter 2, I think it is. How many times in that one verse are they presented as Elohim but as one? Okay. Okay. Let us make man in our, that's two, own image after our likeness. Three and one, three times, three us, us, our. Um, the emphasis from the very beginning from before everything was spread out and before everything was, you know, uh, had, had developed to any degree, at the very creating of mankind, there was a, de a desire, a, a passion from Elohim. Um, Therefore, to approach Elohim would be to do so based on his needs and not our own. Okay, th think of the, what, the first eight verses of uh, Genesis 18 that we're, we've started this with. It's exactly, Abraham sees him, runs to him, and says, my Lord, my Elohim, and all he's doing is thinking about what he needs, what he wants, what he desires. His needs and not our own. From this fact concerning Elohim, we can also discern that Abraham knew God and could recognize him. He knew this was Elohim. Because his approach and his interaction, Abraham's approach and interaction, was immediately based on his needs, his Lord's needs. And 
his needs and his being. Won't you come in, sit down, I'll fetch you a little water, I'll wash your feet, take a morsel of bread? The encounter Abraham has with God seems to be quite different from the regular meetings many Christians claim to have with him. Well, what do we, what do we mean by that? Well, I think that's self-evident. Um, our prayers, many times, were so... In other words, we only know the Jesus that rose and sat on the throne to minister to our needs. And he'll do that for all eternity because he'll put us first. But when you come into a relationship with Elohim, when you come into a relationship with Elohim, it's time to put away childish things. It's time to start thinking about him first and foremost. And it always comes to your mind. You know, I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes we pray as if we don't think God already knows the need. I mean, I'm sorry. But I'm just saying. It's just, it's, sometimes it's just like, you know, now we know you don't know this. So we're, you know, we're going to sick you on this and, you know, get you moving on this. Um, the problem sometimes is that we are praying things that are contrary to his work of bringing us into him in true oneness, like oneness with Elohim, where we, where he can pour out on us because we're in one in that spirit. You know, you've seen me many times draw a picture of the Godhead, of the Father, and the Son and the Holy Spirit and and how they you know the the Father uh, glorifies his Son the, the the Holy Spirit does not speak of himself he speaks of him the Son speaks of the Father there's this constant not I but the other person and we're so used to living in this earth where we're all just individuals scattered all over with a bunch of individual problems and stuff that we haven't entered into something that if we will get in there and we'll pour towards him, then uh, there's, there'll be a flow. This thing flows. It really does. It flows. It's eternal. It's an eternal relationship. It's the only, ooh, it's the only eternal relationship. the only eternal relationship. So what happened with, with Abraham in chapter 17, um, he felt a breach when he prayed something or said something and, and, or suggested something or, you know, and he probably thought he was being real spiritual. Don't you think? Come on, be with me. <laughs> I think he did. I, I, where do you get that from? Because I, I do stuff like that. Or I say stuff like that and have and have failed and have run crossways across his heart with my little ideas uh, pertaining to the earth in time, a certain earth in time in its location on a, on a planet over here and just tore up his garden because I was too, you know, I didn't run to him and say, my Elohim, my Lord, don't pass away. Not my Lord, uh, I got a list. Don't pass away. Stay a while. Uh, for thy servant is here. That I am here to minister to you. You know. He could have kept walking. If he saw Abraham running up and he's going, he's, I got my list. You know, here's my list, Lord. You know, wait, you know, and then the Lord, you know, all three of them start make a sharp left turn and start heading the other direction, you know. Uh, wait, 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 hey, 
hey, you know, this number one through seven is really important. But he didn't. He came up, and, and I, I sense that maybe there was an immediate relief that they, after all the serving that they had done to Abraham, after all of the, the working, see, we would say after all the blessings, after all the answered prayers, after all, folks, the blessings and the answered prayers and all of that for Abraham was toward one end, that he might be made in their image. It's toward one end. Abraham might have said, hey, man, I remember the time the Lord did this for me, and he did this for me, and oh, I just love him, and I thank him. That's fine, except for there's, it's so one-sided, because it's all about, you know, what I got. You know, it's... And so, um, what time is it? I think I should stop. So I just, you know, I was reading this and I just felt God's heart, but this time it wasn't God's heart of disappointment or sadness of, of what, what, how we missed it. It's like, it's like chapter 17 with all the hope that was in God's heart for the seed to come forth. And Abraham shoves Ishmael in front of him. And then you step over into chapter 18 and they look and it's like you're a new man. You're a new man. Your, your prayers are different. Your heart is different. Your actions are different. Your spirit is different. Your temperament is different. You fit in with us. <laughs> and you'll notice, and, and I will end with this, but you'll notice um, that for a change, Elohim, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for a change, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit didn't do anything. They let Abraham do what he said he wanted to do for them. He said, whatever's in your heart. That's what he's saying to us, whatever's in your heart. If it's in your heart, okay. If it's not, don't listen to Randy. Don't listen to anybody. If it's not in your heart, don't, you know. He knows it's futile. He's not giving up. He's just saying, but don't, you know. If it's not there, it's not there. Can't do anything to change that, except for God can wait patiently, and in this case, wonderfully, as he came back just before the fullness of that year was done, and they got to be together before the seed showed up. Oh, my Lord. They got to be together before the seed was fully manifest. Let's pray. Father, we come in Jesus' name and we honor you. We we love you. We love your way. We love your heart. We love your endless giving, even in the face of our endless taking. I, I just want all of this that you show me to swallow me up. To swallow me up. I don't want to be known. I don't want to be uh, considered spiritual. I, don't, I just want your life 
flow happening in me and first and foremost so it'll flow to you. You are wonderful and counselor and the mighty God and the everlasting Father. You are a million names but right now my heart sings you are Elohim and you are mine. You are my Elohim. And I want to I want to be able like Abraham to give that to you. We love you. We love you. We gather together like this because we want you. Hear our cry. See our desire and our deep need for you. For your sake, act and move. For your son's sake, Jesus, for your Father's sake, Holy Spirit, for Jesus' sake, for the Father's sake. Bring this to pass. Father, we ask it in the Son's name. In Jesus' name, the one that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that you are Lord, that you are Elohim. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you, folks. Thank you for taking the time to be together. Pray for one another in this spirit. And let's, let's spread this around. Let's spread it around the world. Bye-bye.